Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to relate uh, to you uh, our story and, and journey and, and motivation on, um, uh, with regards to what we're doing. Um, I was born in India uh, at the age of eight, moved to Canada. Um, at some point, uh, data in this current company uh, that we run got funded out of the UK. So, so although we don't make our products in the UK, we, we, we officially get to say we're, we're a UK company. Um, it, it's interesting uh, to see how few people out there truly believe that a billion people are gonna get on the internet or multiples of billions of people are gonna get on the internet. I think the skepticism around it is about the same as was with the mobile phone. And I think the numbers are much bigger. I think the numbers are going to become very large, very, very fast, and, and our experience shows that happening. And to, to understand what it takes to bring those next billion, two or three on the internet, I think one needs to understand both the size of the opportunity, why it exists, and why, what affordability has to do with it. We are of the belief that the lack of internet adoption in the developing world is not because of the lack of electricity, it's not because of the lack of affordability. It's, it's not because of lack of network access, it's primarily because of affordability. And to understand that, the stick sticks that I'd like to share with you are those of the cell phone versus internet access. And when you look at the growth of cell phone adoption and internet access adoption, and you look at that when it was mostly in the developed world, the differential wasn't more than maybe around 30%. Today, if you look at the number of internet users or homes that have internet access in the US or UK, and the number of homes that have cell phone access, 70% have broadband and 100% and have, have mobile phones. In the, developed, in the developing world, that gap is very significant. In India, out of 1.2 billion people, 800 million people have 900 million cell phones. There are 13 million broadband connections. And the definition of broadband in India, there's a legal definition to it. It's 256 kbps. Um, that gap globally is now over 3 billion people. 3 billion people have access to electricity to be able to charge their phones and have access to a network to be able to talk on those phones but don't have access to the internet. When, when I do presentations to in universities, to MBA classes and engineering classes, I ask the question, if you're on a deserted island and your option is the internet or a cell phone, with the engineers, it's without question, it's all internet. And the MBA guys, you get about a third that think the cell phone, I'm just gonna call somebody out and those guys are failed and I send them out. <laughs> um, the internet's the most powerful thing that's happened to humanity in the last while. It empowers people in such a significant kind of way that it's, it was unimaginable that you could overthrow dictators, as we saw in the Arab Spring, where people could collaborate on Facebook and, and other social networking environments. And that opportunity doesn't exist in much of the developing world. And it's not an issue of literacy. For those of you who have little kids that play around with their tablets, you know, today parents use them almost as pacifiers. It's not literacy that keeps people off of computing and internet. It's all about affordability. The question is, what is the right affordability level? And as we were looking at markets like India, we wanted to try to figure out what is the right price point. We were excited a few years ago when OLPC came up with the idea of a $100 laptop. And we thought, you know, is that the right price point? We did a study to try to understand at what point did PCs really take off in the US? And what we saw was it really happened in 98, 99 when the average cost of a PC dropped below $1,000 
And that was less than a week of salary for the target market. We thought, great, we've got to figure out what that is in the Indian environment. When you look at India, you've got to divide India into multiple economic classes. Um, th that little pyramid on the side w was done on Excel. And when you do that, do, do those figures on Excel, the, the, what's classified as rich in India, those that earn over 1,500 pounds a month, uh, 16 million of these, become such a small dot that you don't see that on that pyramid. And the middle class are those that earn between 300 to 1,500 pounds. And then there's a billion people below that. And what we discovered was that we needed to be sub $50 or 30 pounds-ish in the Indian environment to, be, to appeal to this customer base, to have the same kind of ratios as we saw in the US to drive mass adoption. The question we always faced was, so what's the killer app? If you want to sell to the guy who drives a rickshaw on the hot Indian sun, what's his killer app? Uh, what's going to make him get on the internet? And to understand that, you've got to understand the educational environment in, in India. I saw a study that talked about dropout rates. While India very proudly tells you that it's got the largest market of students in the world, 220 million of them, they often ignore the fact that 68% of kids in grades 9 to 12 drop out, 43% grades 5 to 8 drop out. And the number of kids that should be in school is 360 million. The number of kids in K to 12 that are not in school is twice the population of the UK, that large. <coughs> the, Professor Sugata Mitra um, did a number of studies and uh, got famous as the guy doing the hole in the wall experiments. And if you're not familiar with those, I, I truly recommend searching on YouTube and listening to his TED Talks uh, because he did some very interesting experiments. He took a standardized math test and started giving them to students around New Delhi and got scores in the range of 68%. And he went out a little further out in New Delhi, away from any metropolitan area, and a little further and a little further. And by the time he got to about 250 kilometers outside of New Delhi, the same tests were getting results around 15%. And the reason for that is that in the Indian environment, good quality teachers migrate towards the big cities and don't go out into rural India. You don't have paved roads to get there, there's sanitation issues, there's security issues, and, and so on and so on. And good quality teachers don't end up in rural India, where a billion people live. And that, to us, really showed that Education in that environment is very closely linked to your economic class, and that the best way to solve that, the best way to at least impact that, is through computing internet access. And we've seen that that's the case and what drives people at every level of that society. It's not that the poor don't know that the way out of poverty is through education, it's that they can't afford it. I remember uh, when I was lucky enough to take my first company public on the NASDAQ, making a trip to India, and they were auctioning mobile phone spectrums back in 95. And in 95, people in many of these places thought, why would anybody need one of these things? After 50 years of independence, India has been able to lay out phone lines to 50 million or 30 million people at that time. Hey, the rest of the 1.2 billion people have never used a phone. Uh, they wouldn't be able to figure out how to use a cell phone. Nobody needs a cell phone in that environment. And we discovered that the moment that the price became affordable enough, they were wrong. And we think the exact same thing will happen with computers. And this sort of really hit home to me a, a few couple of years ago when I saw my kids watching a, a video on YouTube, sort of giggling away, and they typed in the search Indian teacher funny, and you get a bunch of videos when you get that, and you get these videos of camera crews that have gone out into the villages and decided to quiz teachers and highlight the deplorable quality education that exists in that environment. And, and again, I'd recommend uh, spending some time uh, watching some of these. 
I won't share with you the full version of one of these, but, but, but uh, a smaller version of it. Even though it's in Hindi, I'm sure you'll get the, the essence of it. If we could run the video, please. अब जरा एप्पल और मैंगो की स्पेलिंग ही देख लीजिए और ये जनवरी फरवरी किस चिड़िया का नाम है मैडम से सीख लीजिए मैडम को संडे की स्पेलिंग नहीं आती संडे का स्पेलिंग क्या पढ़ाती है संडे का एस ए एन डी ए संडे so, while my kids looked at it and were giggling away and enjoying it, I actually felt sad because, you know, I, I was born in India, I spent a few years there, and I had some nostalgia with India, and, and I, I had two issues with that video. First is the realization that potentially millions and millions of kids get educated that quality education. The second was I just didn't think it was right to humiliate anybody on national TV. Um, and I didn't think that any of the teachers wanted to deliver that quality education. And we realized that the way to resolve that, and we felt that the way to resolve it, was the internet. I asked my son, I remember a couple of years ago, and I said, you know, they're doing a lot of changes in school, and what are you seeing as the biggest innovation in education? And he said, rewind and pause. I said, what do you mean rewind and pause? He said, they give us videos now. Before we go to class, we watch a video, and in class, we start doing worksheets. And before, I can rewind my teacher's lecture and pause it. Now I can do that, and that helps me more than anything else they've done in the last few years. So we realized that massive open online courses, the ability to, to deliver videos, the ability to deliver the internet in that environment would be very impactful. And we had a target of trying to create a device under $50, under 30 pounds. And this is how we went around doing it. Uh, we, we tried a whole variety of different things, and then Google came out and decided to make an OS and decided to put it out there for free. Not only decide, they decided to make it free, they decided to show us how to make money off of it. And then they gave the platform to ARM and said, we want anybody and everybody that wants to make a CPU be able to make a CPU. And Three years ago, about 200 companies around the world decided that they were going to start making ARM CPUs. Many of them don't exist anymore, but many do. Two years ago, uh, about four years ago, when the first iPads came out, they used a Cortex A8 one gig processor that costs, that used to cost them around that time around $50. Today, we use the same caliber processor in these devices. It costs us about two and a half dollars. So, so we had nothing to do with it, but that democracy exists as a result. The biggest cost that we discovered were the LCDs and the touchscreens. And by luck, a few years ago when we used to make a product called a pocket surfer, the supplier that made those LCDs and touchscreens for us went bust. And because they went bust, we tried to figure out how to make those screens. And we have a fab in Montreal, and we started making LCDs and touch screens. And we discovered that the margins on those were much better than the margins on the devices or the business we were in. But instead of shifting, the smart people would have gone and decided to make just touch screens and, and, and made a good living off of it. We decided to use that to create low cost devices. But we discovered that the cost of the hardware wasn't just the cost of sale, the cost of sale and the cost of hardware at 3x differential. So we had to create a business model to help reduce that cost also. And that business model involved shifting the burden from the sale of hardware to the recurring revenue streams that come in afterwards. For us, network services, content apps, and advertising generate over 75% of our bottom line, realizing that our customer is very, very price sensitive we make a little bit on hardware, not a lot. We make the rest on the recurring revenue streams, and that further helps reduce cost to us. 
Many people don't believe that these pricing are realistic or, or, or real, and maybe they're, they're vague prices that are only subsidized by the Indian government. Um, so we've been pushed by advisors and others to offer it to consumers uh, in the UK and the US, and we expect um, before Christmas to be able to offer at least online in the UK, Inc. VAT 29 and, uh, 37 pounds and 37 99 in the US market for the entry-level devices, and, and then you go up beyond that. I, I've got a flashing red light there. That probably means that, that I've gone way over my time, uh, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll run you through the rest of this. It's not just about creating low-cost devices. For us, it's about delivering the Internet. Uh, we've created a web delivery platform which we believe will ultimately allow us to deliver free mobile Internet access in the Indian environment. And I won't explain the technology much. We've received 18 US patents around it. And again, before the end of this year, we expect that all of our devices in the Indian environment will be available with free basic browsing, at the least, so that you get this device and you don't pay for internet access on a mobile network. It's subsidized through advertising. I, I can talk about that separately. Um, the result is the very entry-level device, which we sold to the Indian government at around $40, they subsidize 50% of it to students, down to $20. There's a Cortex-8, one gig processor, 512 RAM. Uh, we've got some uh, at a demo table at the front if you want to see how these function. And it's a good enough product. To us, the innovation is in this disruption of the good enough. Clayton Christensen at Harvard did, wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, another great book that, that I always recommend people reading. And he talked about what happens to products, not only technology, but a lot of different areas, where the high end of the market gets pushed out as the low end of the market continues to improve and exceeds the performance requirements of the high end customer. So here's what our journey along, along Clayton Christensen's chart has been. When the first iPad came out, it was a Cortex-8 one gig processor, 256 RAM, and the very first version of our product was 366 megahertz and, and 256 RAM. And by some of the criticism we received, we'll assume that its performance was less than what even the low end of the market was willing to accept. And if you think the iPad, the first version was somewhere between the low end and the high end of the market. The second version of ours, though, used the same level processor as the original iPad. The second version of the iPad went to a dual core processor and doubled its RAM. The third version increased RAM to a gig. And currently, the iPad 4 has a 1.3 gig uh, processor, dual core ARM 7, and a gig of RAM. And the next Akash, uh, there's a demo unit at the front, um, also has a processor in the exact same level and a gig of RAM. I'm not suggesting that we would ever exceed the performance of the higher end product, but having met the performance required of the high end of the market, we believe that the market opens up in a new kind of way. Here's the result of our experience. The Indian market when we entered it was 250,000 units a year, and Apple and Samsung controlled 80% of it. We expected to try to get 20% market share, and everybody said, you're crazy. 80% is Apple and Samsung, and the rest of us are supposed to fight over the remaining 20%. We said, no, no, we're not going after the market. It's a different market segment. The Indian government decided they would buy 100,000 units and put it out for a pilot. In every country in the world, a pilot is a couple thousand units. In India, a pilot is 100,000 units. Um, and they decided to announce the project, and we started generating a lot of publicity. And we weren't ready for our commercial product, and we thought, by the time we were ready, the publicity would have gone away. Let's at least put out a form on our website and allow people to reserve a unit in advance of us putting it out in the market. The moment we did that, we started generating about 100,000 of these orders a day. And before we launched, we generated about 4 million of them. And at the start of this year, we became the largest supplier of tablet computers in India, independent of any supply to the government, um, ahead of both Apple and Samsung. And if you Google it, you'll discover the second quarter that Samsung took a lead. So um, uh, not, not a lot of lost sleep over that. But we spent a lot of time evangelizing the impact of these kinds of solutions around the world. And 
the government of India has decided that they're going to equip 220 million kids over the next five to six years with low-cost tablet computers. Thailand, the Poi Thai Party in the last elections ran a whole program, ran, ran a whole campaign offering low-cost tablets. And in the debate, they were asked, well, where are you going to come up with the money for that? And they said, we're going to get these off of uh, the guys in India. And uh, Turkey has launched a similar kind of project. And now there are 42 countries around the world who decided that they're going to use low-cost tablets, not necessarily from us, but low-cost tablet computers to impact education. For us, while we were trying to figure out how to get to 50,000 units a month in India, we're doing almost double that currently. Uh, it's been a bit of a surreal kind of life. Um, uh, we were invited to the United Nations and in front of 100 different ambassadors, the UN Secretary General launched the product at the United Nations. Um, and uh, it, uh, we, we were able to get the UK government to recognize us as UK's most innovative mobile company. So, so that, that makes us UK, if, if, if nothing else. That's our proof. Um, it's an interesting kind of journey. Thank you so much. My, my 15 minutes probably was 45. I, I don't know. There was no so, clock up there except a it's all flashing, right. we got flashing red light. Three million light. people who'll be listening. Okay. Um, so the entry level device to the students in the Indian schools is about 14 pound, about 20 dollars. Yes. So at the moment, how many of these are out there in the field? So about a million units in India. Um, we've got Zambia and Mexico as strong markets that are also going and a number of pilots going on in about 13 other countries, but, but India is our biggest market and a little over it's a million. Amazing, zero to a million. And then what is your intention? How many do you intend of these to have in I, Indian schools? Um, if you talk to our investors, I, 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 I talk about a much lower number because you put out a forecast, they want you to meet that forecast. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the Indian government has two tenders coming up, one for 5.7 million units, another one for 9 million units. And to, to explain why that's significant, the total number of PCs sold in that market, end-to-end, -end, the total number of PCs sold annually is only about 11 or 12 million units. So the government alone is going to buy f or 14 and a half million of these kinds of tablet computers, plus whatever is sold commercially. So if these tenders come through and we get some chunk of that and we sell uh, annually, we, right. we sell some commercially, um, we expect this for us to be about a half a billion dollars a year revenue Amazing. within the next couple of years in India. So. Here's to the innovators. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.